Welcome, my name is Nikki Gruber and I'm from ETH Zurich. In the next 20 minutes or so, I would like to bring home to you the fact that when we think about ocean acidification, we should not only think about the long-term evolution of ocean acidification as pH is going down and saturation state with respect to aragonite is going down. No, we really have to think about extreme events. And I would like to convince you that these extreme events might actually be more important than the long-term change when we are worried about ocean acidification. The work I'm going to be presenting to you is really the fruit of a very collaborative, collab very collaborative work within my research group, as well as a very intense exchange with Philip Boyd from the University of Tasmania and Thomas Fröhlicher of the, from the University of Bern. In the last few years, we have come to realize that marine heat waves, the situations when marine temperatures are way above normal, have huge implications for marine life. Very well known are the big bleaching events that we have seen in the last decade or so, for example, in the Great Barrier Reef of Australia. We know that these marine heat waves have increased considerably in the last few decades as a result of global warming. We also know that these heat waves have led to much more widespread changes in ocean ecosystems than simply coral reefs. For example, the archetype uh, heat wave that occurred in 2015 and 16 in the northeastern Pacific called the Blob has led to massive changes in ecosystems in that region. These changes included losers, such as, for example, copepods and krill, but also baleen whales. But it also included winners, for example, tuna. While there is no clear sort of direction overall, it is very clear that significant changes have occurred. The question is, well, what about the other? We know that the increase in marine heat wave that we have experienced over the last 20 or 30 years is a direct consequence of global ocean warming. But we also know that there is more in the ocean than just global warming. Ocean acidification is occurring, ocean deoxygenation is occurring as well. And the big question is, well, what will extreme events do in those particular properties? And that's what I'd like to talk about in the next few minutes. I will be focusing not only on extreme events with respect to these individual stressors, when conditions are too hot, too sour, or there's not enough oxygen to breathe, I would like to focus also on these conditions that we call compound extremes, or what I sort of tongue-in-cheek call double whammies, when more than just one of the two conditions are extremes, or even a triple whammy, when all three stressors are extreme at the same time, at the same locations. And those big whammies can have particularly large impact on marine ecosystems. Talk about specifically the following questions. First, what are the characteristics of these double or triple whammies? What do we know about them? Where do they occur? How long do they last? And the second question I would like to investigate how have these characteristics changed through time and what are the underlying processes? So I start my presentation with the investigation of double whammy of the type when conditions are either too hot, at the same time too hot and too sour or when a marine heat wave coincides with a low um, or high acidification event. To this effect, we are using observations, satellite observations, that we can use to assess marine heat waves to begin with. F to assess marine heat waves, that's relatively straightforward because satellites observe the sea surface temperature very well globally. And from those observations, we can directly infer the conditions when temperature are unusually high. We assess extreme events by using uh, the detection of a heat wave when conditions are above the 95th percentile of the year. 
In order to now look at ocean acidification extremes, we do not have such direct observations available. So we resort actually to a statistical approach where we relate observations of PCO2 and alkalinity that we take from SOCAT in the case of PCO2 and alkalinity we take from GLODAP, and we map those point observations to the globe using a machine learning approach. From that combination uh, of, of, of from these maps of PCO2 and maps of surface alkalinity, we then compute can compute the distribution of pH and, and saturation state in, uh, using also the observations of SST. And then once we have those global maps throughout over the last 20 or 30 years, we can then use extreme um, event detection methodologies in the same way as we have used them for detecting marine heat waves. And then once we have the individual events, we can then actually look at compound events, i.e. those conditions when the ocean is both unusually hot and unusually sour. Just to illustrate this effect, I show you here um, a snapshot of September of 2014, uh, where we essentially have a reconstruction, a global reconstruction of PCO2 and a global reconstruction of alkalinity from which we can compute pH. And then within that map of, of reconstructed pH for that month, we have indicated in the this hatching here, or the stippling rather, uh, locations where the conditions are actually unusually sour. Just to illustrate, I will show you a time series from this particular point in the northeastern Pacific, uh, where in black you can see the reconstructed uh, pH through time, and in gray is essentially the threshold that we're using, that's the 95th percent threshold over the, over the, the um, reference period. And we can see how as pH is going down, we come closer and closer to that threshold, and in the latter period, we have now a massive um, or a regular occurrence of extreme events. Then we can combine that detection of uh, pH extremes with the detection of marine heat waves and ask the question, OK, what are the conditions when both um, uh, pH and uh, heat are extremes? And what I'm showing you here on the left-hand side is the intensity of these compound events ex when uh, in expressed in the temperature normally. And on the right-hand side is the uh, intensity of pH when these compound extremes occur. And you can see immediately that the distribution of these, this intensity of these compound events is not uniform across the globe. We have a couple of hotspots, and I would like to emphasize the hotspot of the northeastern Pacific, where typically during marine heat, these compound events, uh, temperatures are two degrees and more above the threshold that we have actually used. And a pH is 0.04 or even more uh, below the, uh, the threshold, again, that we used to identify the uh, extremes. Just to Put this to sort of in the temporal context. Um, so we've did, done this for every year uh, going back to the 80s and you can see in blue the occurrence of heat waves and here shown is the total area of the globe that is uh, at any given time under a condition of a heat wave. Then in red we see the massive increase of the pH extremes driven by the progressively lower pH that we have in the ocean. And in green is the occurrence of compound events. You see that these occur now more and more frequently, mainly driven by the rapid increase of the pH extremes that now then create the conditions where we have both a heat wave and a pH extremes. Just to illustrate this for a particular uh, month of the year. So this is a snapshot of the conditions in March 2011. And in yellow, we have the areas that in this particular month are on the heat wave uh, conditions. Um, in March 2011, we had a very well-known Tasman heat wave uh, that actually was very important historically to get going on our research on marine heat wave. 
And you can see that the orange conditions uh, that are characteristic of um, a low pH ev extreme event, they do not co-occur with the marine heat waves. Now, if we move forward to July 2015, the situation is quite different. We see that more and more heat waves conditions and uh, low pH conditions, the sour conditions co-occur, and in particular here in the northeastern Pacific during the blob event. But we see similar conditions also in the, in the Atlantic Ocean and even in the Indian Ocean. So this becomes now a much more regular um, situation that we have these compound extremes between warm conditions or unusually hot, uh, warm conditions and unusually sour conditions. So let me move on and talk about the potential occurrence of triple whammies. Unfortunately, we cannot use observations to assess uh, the extreme in oxygen because we lack the type of observations. And to this effect, we're going to be using model simulations. In particular, we're using model simulation conducted in my research group on the basis of the regional ocean modeling system uh, that includes a, a full blown biogeochemical model. Uh, the particular setup that we're using for this is where we have a telescopic grid that resolves the upwelling system of California and the Western US very well with a resolution of the order of five to seven kilometers, uh, whereas the rest of the Pacific Ocean is resolved at much lower resolution that allows us for a significant enhancement of the computational speed. We're looking at results from a hindcast simulation between 1980 and 2018 that was done using ERA interim as the forcing. And uh, we, again, we're looking at the extremes uh, by looking at those conditions that are above the first, in this particular case, the first or the 99th percentile. I'm actually going to be showing you an animation from this model simulation. And what we're looking at is then not only what happens at the surface, but actually throughout the upper water column. Particularly, we're looking actually at what fraction of the upper water column, the upper 250 meters, is extreme. And we're indicating that uh, percentage of extreme by the intensity of the color. So if it's very dark, uh, about 70 or more percent of the water column is affected. If it's light color, a very low fraction of the water column is affected. And it doesn't matter whether that uh, extreme event occurs at the surface or at depth. Uh, because the perspective we're taking here is that these changes affect essentially the habitat suitability and uh, lead essentially to habitat compression. We're going to be looking first at individual extremes, so temperature extremes, then we're looking at the pH extremes and then oxygen extremes. And then in the second phase, we're going to be looking at compound extreme between the three stressors. And ultimately, we're going to be looking at triple events. So let's start the animation. And uh, so what you see in black is just any type of extreme that you can think of. Now sh shown in red are the extremes that were particularly hot. So these are heat wave. Now in blue are the low oxygen extremes. And follow that will be the pH extremes. And you can see that there's a very dyna strong dynamics in here. There are eddies uh, in particular that propagate westward. We have upwelling events and lineal uh, patterns that emerge in this, uh, in this particular simulation. Uh, but you see a bit the scale of these extremes have sort of a strong mesoscale component. But you see later there's also a larger scale uh, contribution now showing up in these more gray zones that are associated with uh, weather and climate patterns. And now we're seeing, start to see also these uh, double events. And now uh, coming in the, with these red lines, is the blob event when the sea surface temperature was above 1.25 degrees above normal. And now in July 2015 was essentially a very strong um, triple event that occurred. And you can see increasingly also in, towards the end of the simulation, more and more of these triple whammies that actually are not just affecting a small fraction of, of the water column, but actually all the way uh, Seven, down to ex, uh, affecting 70% of the overall water column. So I'm looking at the snapshot next um, of 
in July 2015, when we actually are sort of at the height of this triple uh, whammy event. So the colors that you see on the left hand side are the the places where conditions are extreme at the time and you see the majority of the North Eastern Pacific is extreme in one in one way or another. We have blue areas for the no breast events. We have the yellow for hot. And I would like to focus on the triple whammy that occurs sort of in a very broad regions uh, of the coast of northern US and southern Canada. And if you look at the average conditions in that rectangle, uh, we find actually that the conditions were really low in oxygen throughout the upper 100 meters and actually a little bit above normal below that. Temperatures were really extreme hot all the way down to 250 meters and pH conditions were also unusually low all the way 250 meters down uh, into the water column. So this is a very double uh, triple whammy and um, and one of the big question is what kind of implications this triple whammy had actually for marine life and I'm actually wondering whether some of the ecosystem impacts that have been described in response to this triple event was actually not only a consequence of the unusually hot conditions but also of the low oxygen concentrations and the low pH conditions. The situation during this triple whammy if, and during the blob are really unusual if you put this into the context of the temporal evolution in this region. You can see that marine heat waves and low oxygen events occurred every once in a while but then st starting 2014 we had a first big heat wave in the region and then the blob event that came and, and left but overall um, was a very massive heat wave that's highly unusual relative to anything that happened in the, in the past 30 years or even 40 years. Uh, but also unusual because now we have these triple a compound extreme or the triple whammy occurring in that region. So why are we seeing more and more of those triple whammies? Well, in the end, it is connected to the main drivers of all of these changes. We are emitting a lot of CO2 in the atmosphere. It's accumulating in the atmosphere that leads to a warmer climate. The warmer climate increases ocean temperature, but also changes uh, ocean circulation and increases ocean stratification. And of course, the high atmospheric CO2 leads to an invasion of anthropogenic CO2 in the surface ocean, and that has a direct impact on high acidity extremes. And the increased circulation and the higher temperature has a direct impact on the low oxygen extremes. So as we're forcing the system with CO2, we're actually pushing um, a system to have more and more of these triple whammies. And what the impacts of, of, of those on marine ecosystem, ultimately on human, also on, on ecosystem service and human welfare, is, I think at the moment is a big unknown. So with that, I come to the conclusions from this part of my presentation. So I would like to submit that ocean biogeochemical extremes are becoming really more common and they're, extend, they're, they're becoming more intense to extend over larger regions. And the trend is largely human driven. Triple whammies that used to be certainly rare in the past are becoming now more and more frequent and uh, is certainly something we need to be very much aware of and we need to be concerned about. And the big st story here is one of ecosystem impacts. Um, we have some ideas of such potential impacts, but I think there is a, is a big question out there uh, how actually all of this will unfold and what the consequences it will have on marine organisms and marine ecosystems. And I think that's really a big new frontier. I would like to switch topic for, um, for, the, for the final minute or so, um, because I've kind of presented to you kind of the latest and greatest science. But the latest and greatest science in the long run is, I wouldn't say useless, but I don't think will be not as effective if it doesn't have an audience. It doesn't have, if it doesn't have people who take that information and act upon it and actually improve the situation upon that. 
And in the context of the uh, ESA-funded Ocean Soda project, uh, we really wanted to make that link between the science I just presented and the stakeholders. So we actually, uh, earlier this year, we started a stakeholder engagement process that would like to report on uh, the, what we have found out and, and how useful actually that was for also for the scientific planning. So we started the project actually with writing um, a sort of a, a white paper that uh, ahead of the workshop that then we distributed to the to the participants. And one of the tasks during the, the workshop was actually to discuss the thesis that we developed actually within that white paper. And out of this came actually a post workshop report. And in that white paper, we actually formulated three theses, and they read as following. So ocean acidification observations need to be available in near real time at the regional to local level with sufficient fidelity in order to guide adaptation and mitigation measures at these scales. Thesis two, the optimal management of ocean acidification requires predictions of the oceanic conditions weeks to months ahead. Thesis three, the provision of information about ocean acidification needs to be contextualized with information about the other stressors. And it's only when we put all of these stresses together, we can actually uh, implement an optimal set of measures to reduce actually the impact of stressors on marine life. And the interesting outcome of our debate was that we find actually very strong support for, for the thesis number one. We didn't find a lot of support for thesis number two, and we found a lot of support for thesis number three, which actually connects very well to what I just presented earlier to show that when we're concerned about ocean acidification, we should also be concerned about the other stresses, and we should be particularly concerned when all of these stresses co-occur, and especially when they occur in extreme conditions. With that, I would like to close and thank you so much for your information. And I also invite you to participate further in our stakeholder engagement process. We'll make actually this report available. And if you have any comments and, and feedbacks on it, we very welcome uh, these feedbacks. With that, I wish you thank you so much for your attention. And we am very much looking forward to the question and answer period. Thanks a lot.